Good afternoon and good evening, dear friends and dear guests and experts and all the participants of the online Citizens Dialogue Europe in the Neighborhood. Let's talk beyond borders, perspective, challenges and opportunities of EU-Georgia integration, organized by the nonpartisan Europa Union Deutschland in cooperation with the Europe-Georgia Institute. I would like to begin our meeting with a very brief, short notice. The Citizens' Dialogue is recorded and we will be publishing it on YouTube after the event. For anonymous participation, please feel free to change name displayed in the settings using the Hogwill symbol. The today's dialogue will be moderated by the representatives of the Europe Georgia Institute, aka me, uh, who will be trying to make this experience and communication with our esteemed experts as interesting as possible for our audiences. Since 2014, Europa Union Deutschland has been conducting citizens dialogues on current European policy issues throughout Germany. Today's citizens dialogue event on EU integration of Georgia is the third and last in a series of citizens dialogues on, U on EU enlargement funded by the Federal Foreign Office and the Federal Press Office of the German government. We would like to sincerely thank our sponsors for their financial support and for enabling today's event. At this point, we would like to also express our sincere gratitude to all the long-standing partners of the Citizens Dialogue of Europa Union Deutschland, who have once again contributed significantly to this event. You can see all our supporters and partners on the slide right now, and we're very, very much grateful to them for supporting us throughout all these activities. I would like to move to some technical remarks, uh, and also, of course, the German government the German Foreign Ministry, our Svertige Seimte, and the Press Office. Thank you very much for supporting us. And now I'd like to move to some technical remarks and to the next slide. I'll be mentioning okay. that everyone should be able to see the three experts, the moderator, and presentation on your screen. There should be also some first aid in case if you're experiencing some technical problems, you can log in and log out through the X link. And for further technical questions, if you still experience anything, please feel free to get in touch with us using the Q and A button in the lower part of the screen. And we are asking each and every of you to very actively participate in our dialogue. You can communicate questions, concerns, and positions in writing. We ask you to use your smartphone, tablet, or a second internet window on your computer to call up the website slido.com. The link will be provided in the chat of our dialogue. And then enter the code hashtag EUD. On Slido, you can submit questions and upvote other participants' questions. Participate in polls and votes. Also via Slido. In Slido, you can switch at the top of your screen between the Q&A area, where you can post questions and polls that we have prepared. Also, soon we will share the screen again, and the presentation shall be visible again to you, and I believe it is visible right now. And also, we are asking you to very actively ask questions on Zoom. If you want to speak or ask questions directly to the experts, please refer to the hand symbol, raise your hand, and then directly we will try to incorporate your questions and statements into the questions during the whole course of the event. After I call your name, you shall be able to unmute your microphone, and then you will be able to speak to the audience. Also, don't forget about the emergency solution if something goes wrong. You can always, in exceptional case, type the question in the Q&A, and then our technical team will try to announce it anyways. 
Now, before we move to the experts and before I announce our wonderful experts, I would like to use a little warm up question and I'm addressing the audience. Could you please tell us what country are you joining us from today? The Slido link is provided on the screen right now. Also, before we receive any results, I would like to say that I am personally joining this dialogue from Georgia, and maybe our experts could also jump in even before the introduction and tell us where are you joining us today. Nada, I would like to start with you. Yes, hi, I'm joining from Georgia. You can see the Georgian flag behind me and you can see the EU flag behind me. So these are two flags in tandem you can see in many streets of uh, Tbilisi and other cities uh, of Georgia. And also lots of Ukrainian flags as well, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Schiffert, I would like to move to you. Thank you so much and thanks for having me. I'm joining from Georgia as well, from Tbilisi. Wonderful. And also, I believe MEP Kaliuram has also joined us. Greetings. And where are you joining us from? Estonia or Brussels? I'm in Brussels. Hi, everybody. Great to have you. So we're also receiving some answers on the Slido platform as well. And I'm very happy to see that we have a lot of people from Germany, some people from France, Morocco, Poland, and even from the wonderful, wonderful nation of Sololaki, which in <laughs> reality is just a district in Tbilisi, but a very, very strong identity one, definitely. So since I believe we are already a little bit warmed up, I think we can now move to our panelists and also to slightly more serious topics. Um, I would kindly ask our experts whom you're already seeing on the slides now to introduce yourselves and tell us briefly who you are and what are you doing? Um, Ms. Kaliurand, I think we shall start with you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Marina Galurand. I'm the member of the European Parliament elected from Estonia. I'm a social democrat. And in this parliament, I'm also the chair of the South Caucasus delegation, which means relations with Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. And you can guess that today's day is not a good day, not for anybody, especially with escalation between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So while participating in this discussion, I'm also preparing a statement that we will publish in the coming minutes. And as the and we appreciate your time. It is indeed a very turmoilous time in the neighborhood of Georgia, and uh, the engagement of the European Parliament is deeply appreciated. And thank you for your time and for joining us today. Dr. Schiffert, I would like to move to you. Thank you. And um, yeah, good evening one more time. Um, my name is Sonja Schiffers. I'm the director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation Tbilisi office, South Caucasus region. The Heinrich Böll Foundation is the German political foundation affiliated with the Greens. Um, previously, I uh, worked in the German Bundestag also for the Greens on foreign policy issues, and I wrote a PhD dealing, among others, with Russian and Turkish illiberal influence in the European neighborhood, including in Georgia. Um, and actually, I had also uh, I also want to say um, a few words about. Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, because we are witnessing uh, major attacks uh, right now um, from Azerbaijan on uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, we have a small office in uh, Yerevan and uh, people are really very worried. And um, Armenia has been um, unprecedentedly um, making steps towards the European Union. And I really hope that the European Union um, will find a way to support Armenians uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia um, at this critical moment. And um, yeah, I'm also with my thoughts uh, a bit there right now. So um, please let us also uh, yeah, find sufficient uh, attention for what is happening there. But of course, the discussion today will be about Georgia. <laughs> of course, but we cannot actually discuss Georgia without Armenia or Azerbaijan. And also the entire region is so much interconnected that Anything that happens to the south of Georgian border is as important as everything that happens to the north of the Georgian border. 
And I'd like to move to Nata Koridze on this note. Yes, um, hi everybody, hello. Um, my name is Nata uh, Koridze. I am actually a career diplomat. I have worked in uh, foreign service uh, for the um, 17 years. Oops. And I'm sorry, I have some technical problem, I think. But um, it happens. Technical yeah, sorry about that. Probably um, a continuation. Yeah, um, but I'll finish. Um, and um, so I worked on uh, many interesting and topical issues for uh, for Georgia. And one of them was um, EU integration, uh, but I also worked on NATO integration, uh, also on conflict resolution, uh, international aspects of uh, conflict resolution. Um, and I spent four years posted at Georgia's mission to the European Union in Brussels in 2008 to 2012. Um, but since last February, I have changed my career path uh, somewhat, and I have been a managing editor of the Georgian web-based news outlet, Civil G, uh, which publishes news and articles in three languages, Georgian, English, and Russian. And which is one of the oldest and most respectable English language news outlets in Georgia, which I would like to add. Thank you right. very much for Sorry. joining us today, all the three of you, especially we, we definitely know that there is a lot of a lot of going on, especially to the south on the Armenia-Azerbaijan border. And we appreciate that everybody is currently able to join us today. I would like to ask our technical team yeah. to prepare for the small video, which we prepared uh, for today and which is telling the history of Georgia's relationship with the European Union and the very interesting, challenging path of Georgia towards the European Union. EU-Georgia relations have developed significantly over the past 30 years, reflecting shared aspirations for stability, prosperity and democratic governance. After gaining independence in 1991, Georgia embarked on a path of democracy and reform. The first Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, PCA, between the EU and Georgia was signed in April 1996 and entered into force in 1999. For years later, the Rose Revolution brought about significant political change to Georgia. In 2003, peaceful mass protests in Tbilisi led to a movement supporting democracy and Western values in Georgia. Following the protests, President Edward Shevardnadze, in office since 1992, was forced to resign and a pro-Western government led by Mikhail Saakashvili came to power. In 2008, the Russo-Georgian War lasted for five days, from 7 to 12 August. Following a full-blown democratic crisis between Russia and Georgia over Georgia's bid for NATO membership, Russian troops invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia, two Russian-backed self-proclaimed republics. After the war ended, Russia recognized the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia on 26 August. Until today, 20% of Georgia's internationally recognized territory remains under Russian military occupation. A year later, in 2009, EU-Georgia cooperation gained a new momentum. Together with five other Eastern European countries, Georgia became part of the EU's Eastern Partnership, a policy framework aimed at deepening and strengthening relations between the EU and its Eastern neighbours, focusing on political association and economic integration. Through its neighborhood policy, the EU grants Georgia between 2021 and 2024 about €340 million Euros to support its ambitious reform agenda. The signing of the EU-Georgia Association Agreement in June 2014 was a major turning point. This comprehensive agreement, which entered into force in July 2016, aims to strengthen political association, deepen economic integration and enhance cooperation in various sectors. At the same time, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, DCFTA, was signed. Today, the EU is Georgia's largest trading partner, accounting for around 21% of Georgia's total trade in 2021. Total bilateral trade between the EU and Georgia has increased by 15% since the entry into force of the DCFTA. In 2017, the EU and Georgia agreed on visa liberalization. Since March 2017, Georgian citizens are exempt from visa requirements for the Schengen area. 
following the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine, Georgia, together with Moldova, applied for EU membership on 3 March, 2022. In June 2022, following the European Commission's opinion on Georgia's application, the European Council discussed the application and stated its readiness to grant Georgia EU candidate status once the priorities set out in the European Commission's opinion have been addressed. In its annual conclusions on enlargement and the stabilization and association process in December 2022, the European Council acknowledged important steps made by Georgia in its reform process and encouraged Georgia to fully address the priorities specified in the Commission's opinion on membership. In March 2023, Georgia once again experienced peaceful mass protests in its capital. Thousands of demonstrators protested against the Law on Transparency of Foreign Influence, a bill that had been introduced by the Georgian government in March 2023 that would prevent non-governmental organizations and media outlets from receiving more than 20% of their funding from abroad. The demonstrators demanded the withdrawal of the bill. The Georgian government was forced to withdraw the bill, demonstrating the widening gap between a Western-leaning population and a pro-Russian government. Thank you very much for this very interesting video. Indeed, Georgia's path towards the EU has always been a long one, but what is the most important about it is that throughout our modern history, beginning with Shevardnadze, continuing with Saakashvili, and ending with the first periods of the Georgian dream, it has been a foreign policy maxima that Georgia was a European country that aimed to return to the European family of nations. Now, I would like to move to our experts, and I would like to ask our experts the introductory question. How optimistic, if optimistic, you are about the relationships between Georgia and the European Union and Georgia's EU integration? Dr. Schiffert, I would like to begin with you. Thank you for this privilege. Um, I will start optimistically, actually. Um, I am optimistic in the long term uh, for three reasons. First of all, Georgia's population uh, feels that it belongs to Europe culturally and politically, and it has understood very much that Europe is the only viable partner for the democratic and economic development of the country, uh, which you know better than me. Uh, it's a bit strange to say this uh, now as the first one here, but um, I think this is absolutely clear. More than 90% of the population in Georgia is in favor of Georgia's EU integration. Um, secondly, uh, I'm optimistic because finally the EU and uh, Germany also have understood that Georgia is part of Europe uh, politically as well um, and belongs in the European Union. And um, in that regard, last year was really a watershed uh, because unfortunately for a long time, some would even say the Eastern Partnership was designed uh, to keep the partners out of the um, European Union or to offer an alternative or at least to leave the future unclear. Um, but now uh, it is very clear that Georgia has a European perspective although it doesn't have candidate status yet. And I believe that uh, the European perspective means that Georgia is on the European track um, and uh, it's it's on the in the enlargement process. It will be reported upon in, as part of the enlargement package. Um, so this is very big and very good news. Um, also, I am cautiously optimistic uh, because many steps have been taken to align Georgia with the EU acquis or EU legislation. And in some of the more technical fields, uh, Georgia still remains a front runner. And uh, it is also clear that jo the Georgian government has the capacity to implement uh, important reforms. However, in the short term, it's more complicated. And uh, we see that in many crucial fields, uh, political will is lacking. Um, but I think we will touch upon this uh, in the course of our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Schiffers. Definitely, as a representative of Georgian population and also civil society, I can definitely agree with you that the absolute majority of the Georgian people definitely feel European and definitely support of the European Union in the country increasing. Now I'd like to move to 
Uh, MEP Kalyurant, would you please comment how optimistic are you from a Brussels perspective on Georgia's perspective within the EU? Uh, yes, thank you. And I'm happy to comment not only from the Brussels perspective, but as a former Estonian foreign minister and as a former Estonian ambassador to Russia, US and other countries, I have been dealing with Georgia throughout my whole diplomatic career, which was almost 30 years in Estonian diplomacy. And I would say that Georgia and all East, uh, other Eastern partners with, with Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, were always under special attention from my country, but also, I would say, from the European perspective. Unfortunately, I'm not so optimistic as uh, the previous speaker, as Sonia was. I hope it's okay if we use our first names, yeah? As Sonia was, and why? For years, Georgia was the stellar. Georgia was the front runner in European integration, in democratic reforms, and we got used to that. Unfortunately, uh, since I became the chair of the South Caucasus 2019, we see deep polarization in Georgian political circles. We see deep polarization in Georgian media, and we see also bigger involvement of Europe in the democratic reforms. I mean, for example, Charles Michel mediation process. Unfortunately, since the time when Georgian government uh, left the Charles Michel agreement, we have seen several steps that for me, who has been also part of accession to the EU relatively recently, who has done it myself, I just do not understand Georgian authorities. Sometimes it seems that Georgian people want accession to the EU, but Georgian government is taking steps that are difficult to understand in Brussels. The last one, impeachment of president. Before that, uh, union flights between Moscow and Tbilisi. Before that, introducing the same law that people protested. Before that, seeing uh, Georgian prime minister and CPAC, uh, Georgian prime minister repeating NATO talking points coming from Kremlin. And I can continue. So yes, we have the 12 priorities that will be evaluated in the Commission report in October. But besides that, uh, closer integration with the EU candidate status is a political decision. And if you listened carefully what Ursula von der Leyen said last week during the State of the Union speech, she made a clear difference between Ukraine and Moldova on one side, that, from, uh, that, that, that the candidates today and with whom the procedure most probably will start with negotiations in the coming future. And then there was Georgia, where she addressed Georgian people and acknowledged Georgian people right to be part of Europe. So I'm not absolutely desperate, but I just feel, I feel sorry for Georgian people. None of the three countries would be today candidates if it wasn't to the war in Ukraine, because none of the three countries are ready today to be the candidates. The war in Ukraine opened the window of opportunity that for my country was in the middle of the 90s. And this window of opportunity, we don't know how long it will be open. And if Georgian politicians will not take advantage today, I don't know when the window will be open again, so I really do hope that Georgian politicians come together and finally start working together, implementing the, uh, what people are asking from them, implementing people's wish and uh, hope to be part of the EU. Thank you. Thank you for this kind of a cold shower, but I can definitely assure you that sometimes even we, the people in Tbilisi, do not exactly understand what the Georgian government is doing as well. And on this note, I would like to move to Nata Korica. Uh, first of all, the original question, how optimistic are you? But also, do you actually understand the Georgian government and what they're doing now? Nata, we unfortunately cannot hear you because you seem to be uh, muted. I'm so, so sorry, yes. 
Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, there are several things that I would like to uh, note, um, hopefully shortly. One, uh, this already was mentioned, but I have to, again, underline this, that 85%, uh, according to most recent polls, I think, of Georgians um, support EU integration. And this uh, choice is um, not only Georgia's foreign and, and um, security policy priority, but it's also rooted in our history, in our culture, in our religion, in our values. And um, I think there is, it, it's fair to say that there is no other issue that unites Georgians uh, to the extent that EU integration does. Having said that, um, our wish is not enough, obviously. Right now, we are uh, awaiting the assessment by the European Commission of the 12 EU priorities that were put forward uh, for Georgia to fulfill if it wants to get the candidate status. Um, and um, yes, it is it's going to be a technical decision, <clears throat> but it's uh, and it's not the only part of the equation, but it's nevertheless very important. Um, and well, we can see that uh, things are not going exactly as we would like them to be going, because uh, according to uh, the latest reports, both the old report by the uh, commission, but also the report of the um, Georgian uh, not NGOs, um, the track record, is, track record is not that great. But we can talk about that later. I don't want to stop on that. What I want to say is that um, Georgia has been striving to receive even the European perspective as such, what we have right now for years and years. And I remember uh, participating in the association agreement negotiations and um, uh, you know fighting for that. Um, um, and we never were able to do that. So um, the fact that we now have the unprecedented opportunity, we have the European perspective, but more than that, we can actually become candidates. And even, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> there is a prospect that you might enlarge by 2030, as, um, uh, as uh, was um, uh, said by um, Charles Michel, but also by H.R. Borrell um, recently. We see that... Uh, we have a problem because we have the unprecedented um, chance, uh, but then again, we have uh, the lack of political will, apparently, from the uh, Jordan, Georgian government to do everything in its power to make this dream a reality. So the most striking feature for me personally is this dichotomy um, <clears throat> or ambivalence, I don't know, of the government's positioning, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the EU. Um, and um, the dichotomy also the, b between the uh, you know the nation that 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 says we want this, there is no question marks about that, and then the government which uh, in declaratory policy wants that, but then there are problems with you know what what it's doing in order to really achieve that goal. So I'll stop here to to allow the discussion to go forward. Thank you. Definitely, the lack of political will. <clears throat> is one of the main points that I think all the three speakers have already mentioned. But before moving to the next question, I would like to use my moderator's ability and remind our participants that you can raise your hand and then we will try to create a list of questions. And then we will definitely uh, ask you to, to announce the questions that you have. Also, I would like to ask our participants to join us at slido.com and to answer this question. In your opinion, what are the main challenges EU-Georgia relations face today? And also, I'd like to ask the same question to our experts. What are the main challenges and opportunities We can't hear George, you. We don't hear you. We cannot hear you. Still don't hear. So I'm afraid that we had a little no. technical issue okay. this time on my side. Apologies for <laughs> this. It was so it's not only me, thanks, thankfully. <laughs> 
Thanks, unfortunately. So I would like to repeat everything that I have been speaking for a while, but once again, first of all, our participants on slido.com, in your opinion, what are the main challenges EU-Georgia relations face today? And I would also like to ask the same question to our experts. I would like to begin with Marina and then to move to other experts as well. Uh, well, uh, before I answer the question, I'd like to reflect on what uh, Nata said. Uh, the percentage of Georgia's support to the EU is impressive. I think that it's not so high in many of the EU member states. And we also hear from opposition and civil society that, for example, comes to Brussels is saying that you should take the decision taking into account the wish of Georgian people. And my answer is, we can't accept Georgian people to the EU without government or parliament. So it's the one whole. It has to work as one whole. So with all the sympathy towards Georgian people's wishes, these are the steps of the government and parliament that are crucial. Also, what I want to say that uh, Nata mentioned, it's a technical decision. Partly, yes. Technical part will be evaluation of the 12 points. But building on these 12 points, there will be a political decision, either to grant candidate status or to start negotiations with Ukraine or whatever. That's the political one. And the political one, as you know, is not taken always objectively and is not always fair. There are so many other factors, and that's why I said it's important to see how what is the perception of Georgia today in the EU and in the European Parliament? And for example, the more we hear that uh, uh, Europeans are warmongering, are asking Georgia to start the second front, European Parliament members are useless, they just do not have uh, understanding of what's happening in Georgia, uh, naming some of my colleagues criminals doesn't work, doesn't work and doesn't help. And it, it will be taken into account while making the political decision. And my final point on Nata's comments is that, yes, I understand that EU enlargement is one of the priorities of Georgia's foreign and security policy. But EU also very clearly, very closely monitors the alignment with EU sanctions. And here we see huge decrease. I think it's about 30%. Because the EU wants its uh, candidate countries to be aligned, aligned in foreign policy, aligned in internal politics, being it the internal market, agricultural policy, veterinary, whatever. And today in foreign policy, the alignment with EU sanctions is about 30. That's not something you expect from a country that wants to be a candidate country. I see. I see. There is a. There is. There are many uh, things already written by the colleagues who participate, and I think one of the points was rigid EU bureaucracy. Don't blame others. That's the rule. Do your homework and don't blame others. Yes, uh, EU is not fair. EU wasn't fair when my, my country acceded. We had to do much more than Finns did, and you will have to do much more than we did. Because foreign policy is not about fairness. Nobody wants you in this club, like nobody wanted us in this club. We wanted to be there, and we wanted to do much more than we had to do. That's something that I think also politicians in Georgia have to understand. You need friends, you need support, you need those who understand what's happening in your countries, and saying bad words about members of the European Parliament or EU institutions does not help. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, definitely, I would like to thank our friends from Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania for the support that Georgia has always had from these countries, but also from other members of the European Union that have been trying to push Georgia and our friends from Ukraine and Moldova towards this club. Also, I do hope that still there are some countries and quite a lot of people who might be willing to see Georgia in the EU, and I'm sure that Marina is also one of those people. So thank you for your support that we have been seeing throughout all this period of time. And I hope that even despite some issues we have with the, some big issues we have with the government, 
the support will not wane in the nearest future. Sonia, I would like to move to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think the main challenge to um, Georgia's EU integration at the moment is the Georgian government's illiberal governance and illiberal, um, increasingly illiberal identity of the ruling party. Um, my impression is that um, when the Georgian dream started as a coalition in 2012, it was a diverse um, group of, of politicians uh, with pro-European uh, forces, with democratic forces um, that were genuinely pro-European pro and um, wanted to secure um, Georgia's future as a democratic country. Um, but these forces uh, progressively left um, the ruling party, first the coalition and then also the, the party. And um, the ruling party has sought for a new identity, um, which is not only um, based on opposition to um, Saakashvili and the uh, former party, a ruling party, United National Movement, um, although this remains an important factor in Georgian politics, of course, um, but it has sought for um, another identity and it has found it, found it in um, right-wing conservative populism <laughs> um, and uh, we have seen the um, uh, so far I would say worst um, results of this when uh, the ruling party adopted in first reading uh, legislation on, on uh, so-called foreign agents. Um, uh, the term foreign agent was changed in the end but uh, in its meaning it remained a foreign agent law uh, based on the Russian model which uh, drew widespread uh, criticism from civil society from Georgia's international partners and also a large uh, large scale massive popular protest. Um, and overall, um, as has already been mentioned, there is a lack of political will to implement uh, the um, 12 priorities um, that the EU has um, yeah, has given um, to Georgia, uh, and particularly in the critical fields where implementation would um, result in um, a curtailing of, of the power of the government or the ruling party, um, specifically uh, de-oligarchization and depolarization where um, civil society judges that nothing has been done. Um, the um, ruling party has announced uh, that they um, have drew up a plan uh, to work on the oligarchization, but as far as I know, it's not public. Um, and um, yeah, so far we have not seen many results. So this is the, the main challenge. Um, and it has also been very clear that the EU has, this is not um, polarized civil society, which is only criticizing the government, the assessments by civil society have been more or less fully endorsed by the European Union, which has made very similar assessments. Um, what is also uh, very clear is that the government in this uh, right wing populist um, identity shift uh, and, and the government and the ruling party has aligned itself very closely with Hungary. Um, even um, today, there were high level meetings between the Georgian and the Hungarian government, and um, they um, continue to share the same uh, and pr propagate the same rhetoric on uh, LGBTQI issues. Um, the Georgian prime minister attended a right wing um, conservative populist conference in Budapest, uh, evoking traditional values, etc. We know this uh, rhetoric initially from Russia, then also from Hungary and others. Um, and uh, Hungary is Georgia's uh, biggest ally in the EU now, that is quite clear. And uh, what I've heard is that it might, um, on the one hand, it diminishes actually uh, having such allies, diminishes Georgia's image uh, within the European Union. And on the other hand, it could also work in Georgia's favor uh, if Hungary seeks to strike a deal uh, on the opening of accession negotiations with Ukraine in, in return for a candidacy for Georgia. Um, um, but of course, this may be candidacy, of course, it's in the interest of Georgian civil society, but this alliance with Hungary, uh, most certainly not. Um, last sentence on opportunities, uh, because we usually, uh, yeah, we are quite uh, yeah, depressed uh, in, in Georgian civil society about the current um, developments. Um, but I think, and I'm ambivalent also about the opportunities, but um, I do believe in the power of the Georgian people, which have 
pushed the government in the last year at least twice uh, very much once to apply for EU membership in the first place and second uh, to withdraw the foreign agent law. Um, and um, yeah, more broadly speaking, when we talk about EU integration, I think uh, a huge opportunity uh, lies also in culture and in people to people contacts and exchange. And Georgia has really made uh, big steps in that direction, uh, especially when uh, we're addressing a Georgian audience and remembering the Frankfurt Book Fair, for example, when Georgia was guest of honor. I think this is absolutely crucial uh, for Georgia's uh, further EU integration that such um, fields are considered as well. Um, but unfortunately, also in the cultural field, uh, we see um, actually quite uh, strong repressions and um, expansion of government control over independent uh, culture, independent culture. So um, yeah, a lot to do. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, Sonia. There is indeed a lot to do. I wouldn't agree with you that we in the civil society are depressed. We might be a little bit disappointed, but we're definitely ready to fight. And as a person who was pepper sprayed, water cannoned, and had the pleasure to enjoy all the wonderful achievements of the Georgian police force during the March 8th and 9th, I can definitely tell you that we are not tired and we will continue our fight. Nata, I would like to move to you now. Yes, thank you. Um, well, so on the one hand, um, it's fair to say that Georgia was never as close to uh, becoming a part of the European family. On the other hand, um, the political relations with uh, the Union have been marked by multiple developments, uh, negative developments, I would say, which were actually hardly conceivable before. I would, I mean, it would be really hard to imagine um, something like um, uh, that happening, for example, um, it was mentioned uh, that uh, the uh, Charles Michel agreement, which uh, uh, was brokered himself personally and hence carries his name, it was completely neglected and the government completely just walked out. Uh, um, and um, the squabbles, the squabbles with the European Parliament members um, or the rhetoric uh, that some mystical forces want to uh, open the second front in, in Georgia. Uh, and uh, um, yes, the Prime Minister flirting with CPAC, with, uh, you know, <clears throat> really, um, you know, dangerous forces or, or not forces that um, Georgia really wants to be seen affiliated with uh, in Europe. Um, then there was this incident when Georgia actually um, denied the EU uh, aid, uh, which was also unprecedented uh, in 21, uh, because we did not, I mean, the, the government did not um, uh, conduct the necessary reforms, and there was a danger that you would actually not give that aid. So preemptively, the government said, OK, we don't want this aid. Um, and uh, this was something really unprecedented. The foreign agents law, I think, was a watershed moment, really, uh, which made a lot of people realize that um, things are not going the way they are uh, supposed to be going. Um, and uh, it also had uh, actually there was something positive that came out of it because um, this unity uh, that uh, we saw when people took to the streets, um, you know, with, with EU flags and they were um, absolutely clearly understanding what's at stake, really, you know, and they opposed these, this law, which was really uh, 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 copy paste from the Russian style law uh, and which was aimed at suffocating, really, the dissenting opinions, the civil society, the media. Um, um, and um, yeah, so uh, it was it was uh, really an amazing unity that Georgia nation showed back then. And I think it had also a great effect um, all over Europe because I mean, uh, we I've heard uh, many times since that people got really um, under impression uh, of, you know, they were impressed by how uh, Georgians uh, carrying the EU flags were, you know, protecting this, this uh, aspiration of theirs. And I, especially this one woman who was carrying this flag under water cannons, she became like a symbol uh, in Georgian society, but also I think, uh, you know, for, for many foreigners as well. 
of, of fighting for, for your rights and for a European future. Um, and um, I just, uh, yeah, as a, as a person who um, uh, has extensive uh, experience of working on EU issues, I completely agree that, that technical uh, parameters are not enough. That's actually, that's what I said too, that you need to, to show political will and uh, momentum. Uh, you need um, uh, to um, to be able to win the hearts of the um, European capitals. Uh, because um, we've seen cases when countries got the candidate status, although they did not fulfill uh, all the necessary, maybe, uh, you know, um, uh, priorities uh, because they, those priorities are also a work in progress. But if 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 um, you don't show political will to move forward, then that's where it becomes a problem. Uh, and I think that's where we have problem as well. And I also did not address this optimist uh, versus pessimist uh, issue. Yes, um, I would like to be an optimist. I have to be an optimist. But again. We have to speak, I mean, we have to, I guess, uh, draw the like timelines, right? In the short term, I don't think I'm an optimist, really. I, I, I would say I'm more a realist because I know how EU works. I know what kind of consensus is needed uh, for decisions like that. I mean, I want to be an optimist, but, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's hard to be in these circumstances. Um, and I just hope that, um, you know, there will be a decision that will not leave Georgia outside that um, I don't know what it will be. Maybe it will be um, something like um, um, alternative decision that will leave Georgia in this, um, um, in this, um, you know, on this path definitely will leave it there. And uh, I don't know what it will be, but I have to be uh, an optimist in the longer run, obviously, because I just cannot imagine, uh, you know, that my children would not, will not live in the European family of nations, because this is something that uh, Georgia really has been striving for um, for decades, but also for centuries, in fact. And uh, I think all, uh, <clears throat> you know, people who want best for their um, children, um, they have to be striving towards it as well. Um, and otherwise, I mean, just one last note, um, I think this what we are facing right now it's something that um can be explained very simply in a way i mean it's not simple the processes that are going on there are lots of factors one thing is for sure that um if a, a government wants to go uh towards authoritarianism uh then of course eu integration is not uh, organic for that government and then you and then there are problems that um arise because um, um, they have to be comfortable with this process, with EU integration, right? But EU uh, is has nothing to do with authoritarianism. Um, uh, it's something else completely. Um, and I think um, that explains the, the problems that we're having right now. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nata. Um, since Marina has raised her hand, I would like to give the floor to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, not, um, I, I really take very seriously what you said, and I agree to everything what you said. I think what's crucial now, whatever the decision will be, how it will be presented, how it will be used by government, by opposition, by civil society. I'm sure that the wedding will be positive. I just also know EU. And if I listen to Ursula von der Leyen, she said that Georgian people deserve and they should have the right to be part of the Europe. So I expect the decision uh, not giving candidate status, but being open and positive uh, towards the future. So now I'm also looking at the Georgian civil society, because it will be so much in your hands, how you will interpret the whatever the decision will be. Uh, I, I, I expect lots of blaming from the government side, I expect the government saying that we did everything, 12 technical points are being fulfilled, but we told you those there in Europe do not understand us. I expect not very positive rhetoric towards EU. So that's why it's very much in your hands to explain to the people what is the situation and that EU definitely is not shutting its door. 
and maybe the next step will be the elections in 24. There is enough time to get prepared for those elections, and I think those elections also will be important. Although, if, if I just judge my, my final remark, I would say about the elections in Georgia. I was a short-term observer during the uh, last elections in 2019, 20, when, when, when it was. 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2020. And if you read uh, Odir, what Odir in the end said, it was really very low bar. It said that the election, elections were well administered and competitive. You can't go lower from there. But at the same time, it's recognized by international community as democratic elections. So do not expect much from the international community during the elections. But I think what Georgia needs, Georgia needs long-term observers arriving six months before, seven months before, who can be on the spot and who can draw attention to any misusage of administrative funds, uh, media, whatever. These are the things that happened last time. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely agree that there will be a lot of backlash if from the ruling party if Georgia does not receive the candidate status, and a lot of blaming from the ruling party will be directed to the European Union. And of course, the civil society, we will do our best to mitigate this and also to explain it to the people. However, we also need direct explanations from our friends in Brussels. So not diplomatic language, not the language of the Brussels bureaucracy that we have been used to for quite a long time, but direct explicit messaging, which will explain that it's not because me or Nata or other people were coming to Brussels and telling you not to give Georgia the candidate status, but because of the actions of the government of Georgia. And I hope that we will be able to receive very straightforward messaging from Brussels at this time, at least, hopefully. I see that you don't agree with this, but let's discuss it during the next conversation. I would also like to remind the participants that you can raise your hands and you will be able to ask our experts the questions. And also, I would like to look at the Slido, Slido right now. And obviously, the lack of political will is something that is being noticed quite often by the people. We have two questions. Uh, two speakers who would like to ask questions. We have a person who is using his initials or her initials, VR. And I'd like to open the floor to the audience and to allow you to ask questions. The first speaker is VR. And also we have a few questions here in the Q&A and I would like to read these questions after uh, we uh, after we have those two questions of the people actually attending this event. Um, hello. If, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Hello, everyone. So my main question is about uh, NATO status, NATO joining. Um, how can you explain us uh, chances uh, of uh, Georgia being NATO uh, main partner and a NATO member in maybe in the nearest future, because uh, I think we need uh, proactive steps from NATO uh, to include Georgia into uh, this big family, big safety family, because it will. I think it can stop. Uh, it can stop Russia. Um, so oh, apparently we're having a little bit of a technical issue, but I think we got the question. The question is about Georgia's NATO perspectives. I think I'll start with Nata because you've been working on this issue for a long time, and I will also ask you to reply as briefly as possible. Nata, please. Yes, the prospect of Georgia becoming a NATO member in um near future, well, I think, actually, I... It's, it's heartbreaking for me to say, but um, 
I don't see that happening in the near future, but I think that if we uh, have a breakthrough on EU front, then it will mean automatically that we'll have a break front on NATO front, because although um, NATO is um, is um, a military organization, it's also a political, it's a political military uh, alliance. So for NATO, um, the, uh, you know, the democratic reforms also mean something. It's, um, you know, it's it's not like it doesn't mean anything for NATO. Yes, for you maybe more, uh, but uh, for NATO as well, a lot. And there's, there have been a lot of signals, um, uh, for example, for the last several visits of the of Javier Colomina, who is um, a special representative of NATO, uh, and he uh, works on Georgia issues very closely. He said directly that, uh, NATO is concerned about the uh, uh, reform pace in, in Georgia, uh, and NATO uh, actually assesses Georgia also, you know, in terms of uh, how it, it, it does in terms of democratic uh, reforms, building democratic institutions, and so on and so forth, because this is also a club of uh, democratic nations. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen a uh, slowing down of uh, uh, NATO integration, um, and um, uh, we've also unfortunately heard uh, certain uh, rhetorics uh, on part of uh, the officials um, that is not helping uh, our NATO integration, such as, for example, the uh, most recent um, uh, comment uh, at the high profile conference uh, by the prime minister when he said that the NATO uh, is at fault uh, uh, for the war uh, of uh, NATO enlargement, basically, is at fault for the um, war in Ukraine. Um, this statement was met with dismay uh, among the expert community here in Georgia, uh, among you know many people who who have been working on NATO integration for years, like myself. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, my my prognosis is that um, at this particular point. Um, unfortunately, uh, joining NATO is not such a, you know, a, a short term perspective uh, for Georgia. And I hope that uh, that we will get there and we will become part of NATO because that's the only as just as you NATO is is really the only safe haven uh, for Georgia, which will allow it to prosper and to become, uh, you know, to, to become truly um, a strong democracy. I'll stop here. Thank you, Nata. Sonia, I would like to move to you with the same question. Yeah, I can basically um, agree with Nata, um, unfortunately. Um, what I've heard is that Georgia's uh, reform efforts in the defense sector and cooperation uh, with NATO has slowed down. Um, <clears throat> also, um, the kind of strong statements in favor of NATO integration have become rarer, <laughs> more rare. Um, and um, this is, of course, seen uh, in NATO um, and by NATO officials, which have who have also, as Nata um, said, increasingly emphasized the need for political reforms for democratization. Um, I unfortunately also don't see much uh, progress on the debate within Germany or other um, central Western, let's say, Western European, uh, Western uh, NATO states. Um, so I am not so optimistic either. Um, and at the same time, I also believe that uh, there is no security for Georgia without NATO um, and that other type of uh, types of defense cooperation um, cannot uh, provide sufficient deterrence and we shouldn't um, we shouldn't have any illusions about that. Um, so hopefully at some point uh, there will be progress, but I don't see it at the moment. Yeah, hopefully in the long run. Marina, moving to yes, you. Yes, uh, ju just uh, just a couple of points to add. Uh, just read the Vilnius communique, and the Vilnius communique says everything. If it repeats the Bucharest wording, it gives the Georgia the right for NATO membership, but it absolutely decouples Ukraine and Georgia. With Ukraine, it says clearly that Ukraine does not need MAP, membership, membership and action plan, for Georgia, it doesn't. So, uh, and if you even look at the other uh, Paris of the uh, of the statement, so the, the VR who was asking the question, my suggestion always is look at the statements. The reference to democratic reforms is completely different. Operation in Black Sea region completely different for objective reasons. So the statement is much weaker than it used to be, even in Brussels. 
But what also I want to say, membership is important, but partnership is also important. And Georgia has shown that Georgia is a serious partner for NATO, starting from Afghanistan and other operations. Your people have fought and stand shoulder by shoulder with NATO allies. And that is also something very important. It's not full membership, it's not sitting around the table, but do not underestimate partnerships. If I compare with Finland and Sweden, they were very close partners of NATO. They were as close partners as real members before Finland completed its membership and then Sweden is on the way, I hope, to complete uh, membership. Thank you. Yes, so hopefully. Membership is still better than partnership. <laughs> The membership, membership is definitely no question, about that. no question about that but try to use the programs that you have joint exercises participations no do not underestimate also that's also important so that nato allies know you they've seen georgian soldiers they've seen the georgian military they have trust in georgian military it also it, it plays the also on polit political decisions Yes, indeed. Georgian soldiers have contributed quite significantly to the international peacekeeping missions. We were and I actually the largest. With we, large, we were the largest per capita participant in the RSF, for example, the Resolute Support Mission. Um, yeah, and um, it also gave us more political clout. But the mission is over now, um, and um, yeah, that also is not very good for our membership perspective at this point. Yeah. Indeed, and let's hope that the Georgian government will not be able to lose all those achievements and all those sacrifices of the Georgian soldiers in a way. Now I would like to move to the second question which we have from uh, um, from the audience because we have a few questions here on our slides. Um, let's begin with the relatively easy one. Should Georgia, it is an anonymous question, should Georgia be collaborating with the Western Balkans on their accession efforts? From my perspective, we definitely can learn a lot from each other. For example, the Western Balkans had a very interesting long way towards the EU. And at the same time, Georgia has also a very interesting experience for the Western Balkans, how to tackle corruption and corruption issues. I'd like to begin with Marina on this question and then move to the rest of the panel. Again, uh, it's, up to, it's up to you to decide, but I would suggest to cooperate more with the countries that are today the member states and with whom we were in the same position. Whether we want it or not, but for 50 years, we were in the same Soviet Union. So trust me, we understand you, and you understand us much better than Western Balkans or Germans or Italians or Greeks or anybody else. So my suggestion is always look at what at the Baltics, cooperate with Baltics, because we did it relatively recently. And when I was saying about, uh, when I was laughing about uh, uh, bureaucratic language, yes, it's true. Sometimes it's impossible to understand what the EU is saying. So for years, Finns were translating to us. If EU says this, they really mean. So now we're trying to translate it to those who want to listen to us. Of course, talk to everybody who is in the on the path of accession, but my suggestion would be to cooperate closely with those with whom we have similar history, with whom we have similar understandings, and with whom and who are today the members of the EU. Well, I really enjoyed this interpreter's uh, metaphors that you used. Definitely, it would be nice to have more translators to talk directly to us. Sonia, the same question. Yeah, maybe just briefly. Um, I, I really um, agree with Marina in a way that, um, of course, uh, it's absolutely crucial for Georgia to cooperate with those who have already uh, become members and to have gone through the full process. Um, at the same time, I do think there is a lot to learn and to discuss uh, in the format of um, Western Balkans and uh, former uh, associate trio now um, applicant uh, countries, um, because um, my impression is that many um, debates have been held in the, in the civil societies of the Western Balkans, which are um, would be really informative uh, for Georgian civil society. For example, when it comes to the role of uh, conditionality or um, the involvement of civil society in the um, integration process. 
And um, I just want to mention one example. Um, for a couple of years, there was a lot of uh, talk in the Western Balkan civil society about um, the EU supporting so-called stabilitocracies. So um, moving on with the integration process, despite a lack of um, democratic reforms, despite increasing a liberal governance, most notably uh, in Serbia, but uh, not only. And um, I think this is um, yeah, one of the key questions that Georgia is facing now as well. Um, should the EU um, give candidacy and uh, thereby in, in fact uh, contribute to the probably electoral success of, of the current uh, ruling party? Um, or um, should it be very strict about the priorities, about um, the, the Copenhagen criteria, which I mean are more relevant later in the process, but, but about the conditionality. And I think um, an exchange uh, between the Western Balkans and, um, and Georgia and also Ukraine and Moldova could be uh, very important. Um, and I think also because uh, there is um, from what I've heard from our offices in the Western Balkans, um, they were a bit surprised, uh, some of uh, some of the civil society actors, about uh, the um, membership perspective, European perspective and candidacy uh, for Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, because uh, the uh, enlargement processes with the Western Balkans have stalled for a long time. There was this term enlargement fatigue, and it didn't even seem like the Western Balkans uh, would eventually join the European Union. There was a lot of frustration. And um, yeah, so I think there are also a um, couple of uh, things to discuss in this regard uh, to um, yeah, get rid of misunderstandings and, um, and learn from each other. Thank you. Uh, and Nada, do you have any comments on this? Uh, it's hard to comment because, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's, it's a simple question. Georgia should be collaborating with everybody to move forward the accession effort. And it can learn something from countries that are in the parallel sort of process. And it can learn uh, other things, not less important things, from countries who are there already. Uh, and yes, I would agree, especially those countries with, with whom we have this shared uh, Soviet, Soviet, you know, past. Uh, so uh, indeed, they, they can understand our challenges sometimes much better than the other EU uh, member states. So yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have three more questions, and I would like to decouple these questions, so to ask each question to each participant, because we're a little bit running out of time. So the first question, how is the growing participation of China in development projects in Georgia discussed in the country and on the EU level? I would like to give this question to Nata. Um, the second question is, that in your assessment, how will the Georgian government continue to navigate geopolitically between Russia and the EU? I think I'll send this question to Sonia. And the last question, will the EU also impose sanctions on people like Otar Patskalaze? A clearer sign of resolution would signal that the EU is not just expressions of concern. And I think this question will go to Marina. Um, Sonia, let's begin with you. Okay, um, well, I think I would start um, by saying that um, I think the Georgian government is trying to get the most out of um, all partners. So um, it is trying to um, get the most out of relations with Russia, uh, mostly economic benefits. Um, but it is also um, trying to get the most, I think, out of relations with the European Union. And um, it is um, in a way balancing, but it is also uh, playing poker. Um, and the question is um, whether the strategy will be successful. Uh, and this depends a lot on, on the response of the EU, I think, to, uh, well, as part of the enlargement package and then the decision of the Council in December. Um, what has struck me is with which, um, pride even uh, some representatives of the ruling party have defended uh, this multi-vector foreign policy while um, Euro-Atlantic integration is enshrined in the constitution. Um, this has uh, this shift towards Russia 
has been uh, defended uh, with the need for caution and um, the need to prevent another Russian attack, which um, in a way is, of course, understandable because 20% of the country is de facto occupied by Russia and nobody uh, wants Georgia to face any more uh, and additional uh, military uh, or other pressure from Russia. But the question is whether... Um, there is only the way the Georgian government responds that that you could or if you could also respond differently. And for example, what we've seen with the reinstatement of flights uh, between uh, Russia and Georgia, which was, of course, decided by Russia. But um, the statements coming from representatives of the ruling party that it's Georgia's sovereign right to um, to serve as a hub for Russians uh, traveling to the EU via Georgia and uh, the new initiatives to um, enlarge airports and even build new ones um, to, to also support this hub function and to profit um, from uh, a foreign policy, which is clearly not aligned with the EU. Um, is very problematic and um, but but they I think they think that uh, they can do it and um, they will do it and they will um, seek the benefits of both relationships uh, as much as they can until um, there is either popular pressure, uh, serious pressure from the EU or um, until the elections. Well, I would definitely not call Russia a partner, but still I definitely agree with all the other parts of your remarks. Marina, uh, Parthalat and sanctions. And should we wait for some similar sanctions from the EU that we've had from the United States? Well, that's not a question to me. As you know, European Parliament does not impose sanctions. These are the council decisions. These are imposed by the member states. I can only say that there were some political groups in the European Parliament who were asking for uh, introducing sanctions against uh, uh, Ivan Ishvili. But uh, but I voted against because uh, no, to impose sanctions you have to have facts and it has to be really something that uh, is some person should be uh, kept accountable for. Uh, but as to Otar Parshaladze, European Parliament, we have not discussed it here. And meanwhile, uh, I'd, I'd like to say that we made a really strong statement on uh, Azerbaijani attacks. So if you go to the social media, social media, you will find the text of the European Parliament. And I'm really happy that we have a strong text there. Thank you. We just published it. Thank you, definitely. I would also urge our uh, viewers to read this text, uh, even though I haven't done it myself. And I'd like to move to Nata with the uh, final <laughs> question on this part about China-Georgia relations. Right. Um, well, I think uh, it took a lot of people by surprise. Uh, I think it was last month when, uh, um, upon the visit of the Prime Minister to China, the strategic partnership was um, uh, concluded uh, with uh, China. Uh, although, I mean, China and Georgia have had um, uh, good cooperation and good relations, um, the way it was done so that, you know, there was no really either public discussion uh, in, the, in the society. I know that a lot of uh, MPs were also surprised. So it, it kind of happened very uh, suddenly. Uh, and uh, just several days ago, actually, Prime Minister um, uh, notified uh, Georgian citizens that the visa uh, requirement has been lifted as well for Chinese citizens. So they can, can come to Georgia now without visas. Uh, Georgia has been uh, participating in uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative as well as um, other initiatives. Um, and um, yes, has been trying to sort of uh, get the, you know, reap the benefit of these uh, big uh, projects that uh, China is um, um, conducting uh, in the region. Um, uh, but there are certain uh, um, concerns, uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, for example, um, uh, regarding the Anakle Deep Sea Port, which is um, a prospective project of great strategic importance for Georgia. And uh, the government said that uh, they, um, they would see actually Chinese, they would welcome Chinese investment in the um, in this project, and we know uh, very well that, for example, U.S. has uh, 
has opposed this um, um, such, such turn of events, uh, um, as Mike Pompeo actually himself said when he was in Tbilisi several years ago. And also, uh, we, um, I mean, you know, it's 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 an issue that, of course, um, uh, is tricky in a way because uh, your international partners cannot dictate to you, you know, who you should have a partnership with and, you know, who you should have good relations with. But then again, uh, considering, you know, the context, uh, uh, it's easy to see why our Western partners would be a little bit um, uneasy uh, if they see um, a lot of, you know, Chinese investment pouring on in Georgia, because we've seen from the experience of other European actually states um, that uh, it comes at a certain price. Um, this kind of, um, this kind of, um, you know, Chinese uh, uh, engagement. Uh, so my question, my answer would be, I mean, that um, uh, in general, it's it's good to have good economic relations and you know dynamic economic relations with uh, all partners. You know, uh, if it does not really uh, create certain security risks, and uh, you always have to look at the price. You know, what do you have? to pay for for actually having these kind of relations with a particular partner. I'll stop here. Definitely. The time and con the timing and context of Georgia's relationship with China raises a lot of questions, especially while we're expecting the decision on Georgia's EU Canvas status. I would like to thank our audience for asking the questions. And I would like to move to the final part of our dialogue today. So I'd like to ask our um, our audience to First of all, join us at slider.com and answer the question, how effective do you consider EU's efforts in mitigating Russia's influence in Georgia? You can choose between ineffective, very effective, effective, very effective, and very ineffective. So please join us at slider.com and choose the versions you wish. And now I'd like to move with the final question to our panelists. What will be your message to the citizens of Georgia, to the civil society and politicians? And also, how would you evaluate the influence of Russia in Georgia right now? I'll begin with Marina, and then I'll move to Sonia, and last but definitely not least, Nada. Uh, well, thank you. Well, my message to Georgian people is uh, is very clear one. We understand and we honor your wish to be part of the EU. And uh, uh, Nata said that she can't imagine her children and grandchildren not being part of the EU. I can say the same. I can't imagine my children and my grandchildren not sitting in the European Parliament without Georgian members of the European Parliament. So yes, uh, that's a dream. We appreciate it. Civil society, Georgia has a very strong and uh, active civil society. And I think that you're doing a great job. But I also think that people need your positions and maybe explaining some things in a more simple language than the European bureaucracy and maybe bringing the political slogans to the level that people around the kitchen table can discuss and understand. And we need your help in explaining that EU is on your side. EU is not against Georgia or Georgian people or Georgian dreams. We support them. And to Georgian politicians, I've been saying it since 2019. The polarization does not help come together and start cooperating. It was a wrong, it was a mistake by the opposition not to join Georgian parliament because people gave their mandate to be in the parliament and to work there. And they should have taken that mandate and started their work. Unfortunately, the, the polarization is today so big, I just do not see that it can come smaller during the pre-election year, Georgia's going into the election. So politicians try to be above your party interests and put your nation's interests higher than your party interests. Uh, of course, Russia, Russia is, uh, Russia is uh, using its information campaigns, information operations, not only against Georgia, but EU, EU member states, NATO, NATO allies, it's a new reality. It's there. And you have to fight it. 
Personally, I do not know how will the huge influx of joy of Russians and Russian money and Russian finances, what will be the influence on Georgian society? Uh, with the Ukrainian war and the thousands, tens of thousands of Russians coming to Georgia today. I was in Batumi half a year ago, half of the cars were then Russian cars. Definitely they will have an impact on your society. And uh, I don't think that the impact will be only positive. Thank you. Yes, I definitely agree with you, especially on the impact part. And the civil society has been advocating, lobbying, call it whatever you wish, for stricter migration measures. Unfortunately, the government does not often listen to us. Sonia, I would like to move to you. Yeah, maybe I'll take it from there. Um, I've already talked a bit about um, the positioning of the government towards Russia, but maybe um, in a couple of sentences, um, to put it more broadly, um, in 2012, the Georgian Dream um, Party and Bidzineva initially personally um, entered politics, uh, among others, with the promise to normalize relations uh, between Georgia and Russia, um, to restore uh, Georgian exports, to Russia, which were under uh, a ban um, embargo, and um, uh, he was successful. Uh, within a few years, uh, Georgian exports, uh, Russia became again one of the major export uh, destinations for uh, Georgian products, and uh, we see uh, dependencies in some uh, sectors, but specifically uh, wine exports and tourism. And uh, I recently spent all of my three week summer vacation in Georgia and um, I saw a lot of um, Russian tourists, uh, not only in Batumi, which is widely discussed, but uh, also in the mountains. And um, uh, of course, Russians do not have so many destinations uh, right now to travel in Georgia is easy, um, easy to access. But um, and I'm personally not um, as critical about the Russian migration as some others are, but um, I do think that this um, continues to deepen uh, Georgia's economic uh, relations, obviously, and also in some ways dependence on Russia and could be a factor if uh, Georgia is again under um, under clear Russian pressure. I mean, it is all the time under Russian pressure, but uh, if there is a, another attempt to dis decide um, from Russia on, on Georgia's uh, political orientations, for example. Um, um, to uh, we, we do not know, so in a nutshell, um, I personally do not know to what extent uh, some of the decisions taken by the Georgian government are influenced uh, by the Kremlin or are taken with a view on the Kremlin, uh, so-called preemptive uh, obedience, but uh, it is clear that Russia is a major factor uh, in Georgia, not only um, because of the uh, political and security uh, situation, but also be a big economic factor, which is relevant for many people also in the regions uh, who ex export uh, fruits and vegetables, for example. Um, and. Um, to conclude, um, what do I wish um, the Georgian people or what do I expect? Um, I believe in the choice of the Georgian people uh, for democracy and for European integration. And um, I think this choice needs to be taken seriously uh, by the government, um, but also by the opposition. And um, there is a window of opportunity um, next year. Uh, there will be elections. We have already discussed this. And right now, the opposition is still very fragmented. Um, and I think uh, we all need to watch and uh, to see um, to what extent uh, the opposition will be able to overcome some of the uh, differences. And um, this will be crucial um, and maybe even decide um, the elections. Um, and about civil society, I also I very much agree with Marina that civil society is strong and has uh, had some really uh, important successes in the last year. Um, my impression is that uh, people are also tired, uh, which is very understandable because uh, they have been pushing for uh, democratic reforms, for European integration, some of them for, for 20 years or more. And uh, every year there are new protests and um, it, it is tiring. But uh, right now uh, it's a unique window of opportunity. 
and uh, we need to um, to use it. Uh, we uh, also, because we are based here, but of course, Georgian civil society uh, more than we as a German foundation. Um, and uh, I think it will be cru crucial to also reach out more to the wider population because the trust uh, in civil society, in, in NGOs, is relatively low um, also because of the um, propaganda against uh, CSOs. So I think if um, Georgian civil society, organized civil society, um, uh, they should um, make more efforts to reach out to the wider population and to, to join forces, uh, which has worked uh, for the foreign agent law, but for a stable kind of relationship and uh, future, uh, so to say, to bridge the, the gaps, um, Georgian civil society could reach out more to um, to the broader population. Um, but again, I believe uh, that uh, it is not all lost and um, Georgian civil society is strong and the will to join the European Union is strong. And um, I think there are still plenty of chances to do, to do so. Thank you, Sonia. I definitely agree with you that the civil society needs to push back and we will definitely be doing it. But we also need more support from our friends in Europe because when we're facing almost unlimited resources, both in propaganda and also in resources of the ruling party, it's always complicated to fight against propaganda, misinformation, and all those attempts to discredit and demonize the civil society in the country. Nata, I would like to move to you. Yes, well, I don't have much time, but I'll try to be short. Several points. One, it's very emblematic, actually, that uh, just a couple of days ago, um, U.S. Uh, has uh, sanctioned uh, the former uh, prosecutor general of Georgia, um, Otar Pertzhaladze, we already mentioned him, uh, for channeling the Russian influence in Georgia. Uh, I think it's quite an extraordinary case of actually a figure who used to be a prosecutor general, you know, sa sanctioned for something like that. And it then creates, um, um, you know, a lot of questions, you know, question marks, raises question marks about, you know, what is really, the, how deep is the influence of Russia in this country? Um, and we have, um, yes, recently seen um, all kinds of um, uh, measures such as the um, direct flights, abolition of visa regime, also quotas for higher education for Georgians, for youngsters. And um, it goes without saying that the information war is really, uh, you know, uh, being waged against uh, against the Georgian population uh, with uh, all kinds of uh, confusing messages about EU, about NATO, anti-Western messages in general, but also uh, the messages about the war in Ukraine and trying to create, uh, you know, question marks about how it will go and things like that. Um, and... Um, I want to um, actually comment and uh, on what Sonia said when she mentioned that um, Bidzine when she was successful in uh, you know uh, restoring exports of Georgian products and and sort of you know having dialogue with Russia. I think it's fair to say that I mean I have a little bit of different uh, view on that. I think that. Uh, it actually makes Georgia more vulnerable to have, uh, you know, an increase in exports to uh, Russia. We have, uh, we all remember 2006, the total embargo by Russia uh, on Georgia and how painful it was. And you simply cannot rely on Russia ever in anything. Um, sorry, on, sorry and, to intervene. I just want to clarify that I absolutely agree. Um, he was successful from his perspective, but oh, if yes, it's right. good for Georgia, that's yes. a different question. Right, right, right. Yes. And then, yeah, he um, also, um, during that time when the Georgian dream came to power, the Karas and Abashidze format was established, which is completely not transparent and you know uh, what's going on there behind the closed doors the information is never really uh, getting out and that's also uh, i think problematic uh on the um polarization i think that it will become worse i'm sure it will become worse because what we see now the polarization is actually now sort of um <clears throat> structured around the eu issue so eu integration has become uh, on the, which is really uh, incomprehensible because on the one hand you have 85 percent 
who want to become part of the EU, but then you have this polarization, which which uh, among like political parties and political parties um, which um, are strongly pro-European, uh, the opposition political parties, um, they uh, criticize the government, and then government gets you know back with the uh, bashing and you know <laughs> calling them radical opposition and satanists, uh, or I don't know like the, the youngsters who, um, for example, participated in, in the march. Um, um, march uh, demonstrations they they became also an object of of um, a very strong uh, criticism uh and actually sometimes persecution by the government um uh, so i think polarization as we're getting closer to the elections is going to get wor worse i'm sure uh, of that and i think that also polarization is really and I, I even wrote an article about that once that it's not it's 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 um you know, it's not a symptom. Uh, it's it's rather a disease of the political system we live in. Uh, because I think the problem is that for the um, for the Georgian Dream government, depolarization means the lack of dissenting opinions. That's what they mean when they say, you know, uh, we need depolarization. Unfortunately, that's what they mean. Um, but then it means there is no pluralism, there is no democracy, no freedom of of of, of speech or expression, and freedom of and of speech and expression is is the absolute cornerstone of any democracy. So um, if depolarization means that, I don't want that kind of depolarization. Um, and <laughs> then the last point on elections, yes, I think um, uh, it was mentioned before, it's absolutely crucial um, that we conduct good elections, fair elections, and it's absolutely crucial that the uh, EU, uh, US, uh, you know, our partners stand by us in, 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 in uh, monitoring it and not during the day or like a couple of days of elections, but I think what Marina mentioned that we have long-term observation missions here on the ground, because we all know that in fact, uh, the worst things that happened with elections happen months prior and not on the election, you know, on the day when, when people cast their ballots. Um, and in general, I'll just finish here. I think it's crucial again and again, that we are not left alone we are not left behind the georgian nation feels the support of um the european union in this particular case and i think it was crucial during the march demonstrations as well of course it was us who you know went out and 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 protested but i think that ultimately the position uh, of the eu or um, of our other international partners who condemned the law who were unanimous in their um condemnation of this uh, abhorrent law, really. Um, I think that that played a huge role as well. So um, my wish would be uh, for that support to continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nata. So apparently we're coming to an end of our meeting. I would like to definitely thank our guests. Um, Marina, thank you very much for long lasting support that we have been enjoying from you personally and also from your country and all the Baltic states. Sonia, thank you very much for all the excellent jobs that you, the Bell Stiftung, the Adenauer Stiftung, the, my personal favorites, now one Stiftung are doing in Georgia. And Nata, thank you very much and all those people who are fighting for Georgia's European future on the ground. I think we're trying to do our job well. Now I would like to move to a very interesting part of our panel. We have Manuel Reckert with us, who has been visually um, describing our panel for this whole time. And I'm very much eager to listen to you. What have you been doing all this time? And also uh, to see the final result. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Manuel Recker and I work as a graphic recorder. For those of you who don't know what a graphic recorder is, I was listening very closely to the last 90 minutes of the debate and the discussion um, that the panelists have been having and um, the Q&A that the audience contributed. And I illustrated um, a summary of this event that I would like to share with you now. Um, I had to draw very fast, so I still need to Take some time to finish it. Um, it should be displaying now. We're eagerly awaiting. 
Okay. A lot of information, but I just want to give you, this is just a small teaser. Um, you will be provided with the final graphic recording um, after this event. You will receive a newsletter. Uh, in a, you will see, receive the follow-up email where you can uh, take a look at this in detail and remember the points that um, were discussed today. And feel free to use this also to share this with your colleagues or to use as talking points in your next conversations that you will have about this topic. Um, wow, yeah. I'm very surprised to see even the United States, American state here on the, on those graphics, but it's really interesting. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing, and we'll hand the hand the word back to George. Thank you very much. Thank you. It looks very impressive, and thank you very much for doing this. Um, I'd like to announce the next citizens' dialogue, which will be held on the Polish elections in the beginning of November. The link for more information on the citizens' dialogue shall be and can be found in the chat. If you would like to stay informed about the future citizen dialogues, you can also sign up for the EUD newsletter with the link on the chat. Again, I would like to thank all the participants and all the experts for a lively, vivid discussion. It was definitely enlightening, enlightening on some points. The podcasts of all the three citizen dialogues on EU enlargement will be published in the coming weeks. And you will be able to listen to this and the previous podcasts on YouTube as well. I'd like to thank also the wonderful team of the Europa Union Deutschland who have been doing a tremendous job in the background. I'm not sure if you will be joining us, but you definitely deserve a round of applause for organizing this and also for doing all the excellent job in the background. And also I'd like to mention that there will be an evaluation questionnaire right now probably uh at the end of the seminar and we kindly request all the participants to feel it because we need this feedback to improve the citizens dialogue in the future again thank you very much for attending and thank you very much to the experts it has been a pleasure for me to moderate and i hope that you also enjoyed it at least a little bit thank you and this dialogue is over thank you